I'm the uh, Associate Provost and Director of the Galasano Institute for Sustainability at Rochester Institute of Technology. And I'm also the uh, CEO of a national institute uh, called the Remade Institute, which is established uh, by the government to uh, support development in the circular economy and sustainability areas, sustainable manufacturing areas specifically. And it is a large consortium consists of 148 entities from industry to academia, national labs, trade associations. Uh, and this is the, uh, again, this is part of my responsibility. Sure. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. You know, a lot of people think they know what sustainable manufacturing is. Uh, are most of us right or what do we not understand or know about sustainable manufacturing? So sustainability is about the balance in the system, supply and demand, ensuring that, that we are basically taking into account in our industrial system the, 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 the impact of what we do and also make sure we understand the, the supply side of this raw material that we use and, and also understand the, the environmental impact and make sure that we have, a, we, balance, uh, we balance this picture to make sure that we're not causing uh, a lot of harm on the environment uh, unnecessarily and, and also making sure that we we actually are watching our consumption of materials and, and raw material to ensure that we were able to to satisfy our demands in the future um, w without really having any big big challenges. I think when you talk about sustainable manufacturing, uh, there is a you know there typically there are a lot of information that is only addressing one piece of the puzzle and uh, very seldom we see something that describes the whole picture. So, it, you know, in reality, since the beginning of the industrial uh, revolution, we had abundance of resources, we had abundance of materials, Right. So it sounds like what you're seeing is that today's developed countries picked up a lot of bad habits in developing the economies that we have today. And we don't want today's developing countries to continue those bad habits, but we want them to increase their standard of living without the same impacts on the economy. There was an article uh, a long time ago, I think, I can't remember if it was Business Week or something like that, that said uh, China or and India either they will destroy the world or they will save the world. And I think the rationale of that in this article was that, that if they copy with their population level and everything else, uh, they copy the model that we used in, in the West in building our industrial system with all of it is the consequences with that. And they, they do that at a much higher scale now because of their population and size. Uh, they will destroy the world. That was a, that was the, the more of the article, um, you know, talking about. And it, but however, if they are much more innovative and come up with much more efficient methods, uh, they would save the world because that because again, the scale of what they do is significant. And you know, I was uh, in I, a lot of my lecture. I show pictures from a hotel room where I I was in China in Shanghai, and. I, I basically, I was there for two weeks. So I just, in a Friday, my hotel window, I took picture and you can see, you can't even see the building across the street. The day after, I mean, Saturday, I took the same picture and all of a sudden there are building across the street. The haze and the pollution is just significant from the industrial development there. And again, it, they are using, they are copying things that we've done in the West, but they are, what we did in the West was not at the same scale. So what happened is that they just, at the scale, they developed their system and copying a lot of those methods result in significant impact that, 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 that we was not predicted. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, you know, again, the, the, the scale is, is really a major factor in a lot of challenges that we see in this area. Do you remain an optimist in, in your endeavor? You, know, you talk about how these two countries could either ruin or save the world. Uh, are you still an optimist? Absolutely. I think there, um, you know, the key here is that there, there, there are limits. If, you know, it, my panel was, was the United Nations Environment Program, actually, uh, it, it, we do reports, we call it the um, Global Resources Outlook. 
And uh, I think the last report was in 2018. I'm working with a team now and developing the next one is going to be 2023. And, and, and we're saying that basically in greenhouse gas emission, if business as usual continues, we're probably going to increase greenhouse gas emission by 2050 by you know, 47%. However, we're showing that with sustainability and with if we are to employ a lot of the sustainability uh, some bill, measures uh, across the globe, we can reduce greenhouse gas emission by significant percentage. We're talking about like 90%. So there, so there is a, there's optimism if we are to employ many of those measures. However, I've been around for many years and um, you know, it's always disappointing to see that the, the, the indicators are there, the, the approaches to address some of those issues are, are identified, but, but the, the will to actually employ it isn't there. So, so yeah, I mean, it, we, we haven't lost it yet, haven't lost this battle yet, but, but there is definitely uh, urgency in moving fast. Otherwise, uh, you know, the, some of those, you know, some of those um, factors that we're looking at today are irreversible. You know, from biodiversity to greenhouse gas emissions to rise in, in, in temperatures and all, and all of those factors, I think uh, once you reach that point, uh, you know, a turning point, it's hard to reverse some of those measures. Sure, sure. Were there any challenge, were there any lessons we learned during COVID that can be applied to today's challenges going forward? I think, you know, unfortunately, people forget very quickly uh, you know, we, I think we, we, uh, we learned during COVID, for example, there were a, like a lot of work going on, including with my organization. We had our healthcare system in New York state. We had this alarms about ventilators and all of this stuff. And we had a lot of organization, including mine, worked on developing emergency ventilators, a uh, fast way to, uh, to provide substitute materials that use for healthcare system. And what we learned is that a lot of this stuff happened very quickly and we created a lot of stuff that were very valuable and useful. Uh, so when we put our head into something and when we have a crisis, we, 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 this crisis got us to work together and having a solid goal to go after and we were able to meet, uh, to meet that goal. In the environmental area, I think, and in sustainability area, we do have a crisis. It just not been treated as such. And uh, you know, you see the inter intergovernmental panel on climate change talking about code red and and raising that alarm. But a lot of a lot of the you know governmental organization. I mean, we we turned a lot of a lot of the issues, uh, a lot of the debate over climate change and many of these issues into a political issue, uh, where it should have been left to the scientists. Mm -hmm. I mean, there the politicians are divided over climate change and its impact. The scientists aren't, and and I think this issue should have really been left to the professionals to address. To, to, to guide and inform policy. Uh, however, the issue has really got lost in, in a lot of the political debates, uh, but we do have a crisis like COVID and, and the implications are severe and, and it's, the, the issues are not treated, treated as such. And final question, give me the elevator pitch on remanufacturing. Yes, yeah, so, so one of the the the, uh, the 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 most effective and, uh, and 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 amazing technology that was developed in the U.S. here many many years ago, uh, Henry Ford was actually one of the industrialists actually that that started the organized uh, facility for this is remanufacturing. So remanufacturing simply is an industrial process that take product that are coming back from, from the use phase um, and, and through a very rigorous industrial process, we disassemble the product to the component level. We clean, inspect, restore, and, and, and deal with a lot of parts. And sometimes if parts are, are basically worn, we replace them. And then you go through an assembly process of a product similar to what we do with a brand new product. The difference here is that 
many of like uh, large durable parts of the of product like engine or jet engine or something like that, they have multiple life cycles. And once you qualify that they are absolutely meeting the specification as new ones, then they go into making of a new product or a new remanufactured product. So remanufacturing is basically a process by which we'll bring a product that's coming back from the use phase and bring it back to like new condition. And the reality is that by doing so, you're using anywhere from 70 to 90% of materials coming back from the use phase. You don't mine for version material for that. You're saving the energy that made those parts. You're saving the capital equipment that made those parts. You're saving the labor cost. So the, the savings are significant. The saving is, is about 50%. For example, so you, you, you're providing the consumer with a very um, high quality product, similar to brand new products, you know, companies like Xerox, Caterpillar, GE was medical equipment, uh, aircraft, uh, parts and stuff like that. 